Our first speaker will be uh, Randy Bryant. Um, he is splitting his time between OSTP and uh, Carnegie Mellon, where he's been for over 30 years. And our second speaker is uh, Tim Polk, who uh, is a detailee to OSTP from the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology. Um, and they will coordinate how they're going to split the, this, this talk. Oops. I almost tripped on the bottom. Okay, thank you very much, and it's uh, great to have this back-to-back uh, -back presentations of two major initiatives in high-performance computing. Uh, as I said, I'm uh, Randy Bryant. I'm um, normally a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon, but have spent the past year at OSTP. Um, and many of you know that on July 29th, the president signed an executive order creating the National Strategic Computing Initiative. And, um, what does that mean? And, and that's a lot of what we're discussing today. Well, first of all, it's an initiative. So really, the NSCI is really the beginning of something. And quite honestly, uh, I admire the Europeans for having their whole plan laid out in the way they do. And we're not at that point yet. We're much more in the mode of we know generally what we want to do, but exactly how we're going to do it remains uh, to be determined. Uh, so the executive order listed uh, five strategic priorities. And I'm going to rearrange and rephrase things a little bit. But roughly speaking, the first was we want exascale computing. The second is we want to combine traditional modeling and simulation with data analysis. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that there'll be a technology base uh, once uh, current CMOS technology sort of reaches its limits. Uh, and we want to make the whole system work together. We want to have all the not just the hardware issues, but all the many software application issues resolved. And also uh, make this work not just within the government, but as a collaboration with academia and industry as well, uh, which is a very critical part for success. So uh, I'm going to present this by pulling out five themes that are related to these strategic objectives, but phrased a little bit differently, just because I think it's uh, more logical to present them. So the first is this idea of, if, are we looking for flops or are we looking for petabytes? And the answer is, uh, yes, we want it all. And I'll talk about that a little. The next is, um, you know, it's important for the US to have a leadership role in high performance computing. The, Third is uh, we want to make it much easier to develop applications for HPC systems. Uh, <clears throat> we want to make them uh, more usable, more accessible by a much wider range of, of uh, the US population. And uh, the final one is we need to make sure that beyond the, exist the current generation of HPC, which probably will be using uh, more or less the technology we knew today, we want to ensure continued progress in the future. So starting with the first one, um, some of you were at a panel this morning on this topic, and you'll see that I'm uh, using my slides in both cases. If you think about it now, there's sort of two classes of really, really big machines out there. Uh, one is the supercomputer, of course, which is what this conference is all about. And those are machines built really to solve the world's hardest problems, ones that either couldn't be solved or couldn't realistically be solved using lesser resources. Uh, but over there, out in the world, too, there's uh, quite a few data centers now that uh, are operated by companies like internet companies, uh, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and so forth, that also contain huge amounts of processing power and storage capacity. But they're really designed, on one hand, at a very different scale, that they're designed to handle millions of people doing relatively simple transactions. But they're also now increasingly being used to analyze the vast amounts of data that are being collected and running actually very sophisticated uh, algorithms to do that data analysis. 
So you can uh, sort of plot these two classes of machines on an axis where the vertical axis is how many bytes, petabytes of data do these systems have to manage and deal with on a daily basis? And the other is how many flops do they deliver uh, in uh, numerical performance? And as I argue, uh, these two really live in very different uh, parts of the space. And there's relatively little in between. You're either very good at data or very good at number crunching and not much uh, in between. Uh, but if you look and you talk to both uh, classes of people, you'll find that they each want what the other one has. So in particular, the world of simulation is also all of science and engineering is becoming increasingly data driven. So not only do we want to run simulations of uh, potential systems of some sort, but we want to also take the real world data that uh, based on observations and measurements and integrate that together with the simulation and get a, a more coherent model and more predictive uh, capability. Uh, we also are with these systems generating a huge amount of data that need to be analyzed to understand what phenomena are arising through these simulations that need to be understood. Uh, on the uh, data analytics side, the, the algorithms that are being used are increasingly more sophisticated numerical algorithms that begin to look like the types of computation and their uh, time requirements and capacity requirements that resemble those of traditional HPC. So really, uh, people would like uh, at least a machine or a combination of machines that could do both. And one of the conclusions of this panel this morning was, and if we had that, we could start thinking about whole new applications of ways of solving problems where we tightly in a optimization loop build in actual collected data um, with uh, simulation models and progress toward much more advanced uh, capabilities than we can even dream of today. The, the challenge is that these things really live in different worlds and they're very different, starting from the hardware levels up through how they're programmed and operated. So at the hardware level, the supercomputer is a heavily engineered system optimized for high reliability and a very uniform and homogeneous uh, operation mode. Whereas data centers, at least historically, have been much more driven by cost considerations and scalability considerations, and so they tend to use lower quality hardware but then use software mechanisms to guarantee fault tolerance and reliability. Uh, in, a, in a supercomputer, the objective is to, for the runtime system is basically to get out of the way and let those nodes just uh, go at full speed uh, uh, doing their numerical computations and have everything sort of just perfectly synchronized so they can exchange data at the right moments of time and everyone is moving at the same pace. Uh, whereas in a uh, typical stack for data analysis, it's a very dynamic uh, runtime that's uh, doing dynamic scheduling. And uh, then at the programming level, again, because of the focus on performance, typically if you're programming an MPI or something, you're writing code that is describing what each processor should be computing at every point in time, whereas a, an, a framework such as Spark or Hadoop gives you a much more data-centric, high-level view of the computation with relatively little concern of how does that actually get mapped onto the individual processors. And I'll say, if I sound like I'm sort of overly favoring the data people, let me say that you know, the performance that uh, these supercomputers get through their mechanisms is way beyond the performance you could get out of a data center style uh, system or programming environment. Uh, a lot of, of sort of the raw computing power of those systems is left behind through the, the ways they're implemented. So the main point is these things really are different beasts and it's no small thing to say, how could we create a convergence of these two? Um, and so I'll just say, and that's why it's something that's uh, part of a uh, strategic computing initiative. It's an unknown, uh, many uh, aspects of it. And so we have to look to the future and figure out through research and other activities, how will we make this happen? The second is, um, how will we keep the US at the forefront? And um, uh, you know, the old question comes, so who's in, in the lead here? Is it uh, Tianhe 2 with its uh, 34 petaflops, or is Titan with its uh, 18? Looks like uh, the US is about halfway uh, there. Uh, but 
first of all, I, let me point out that this has gotten a lot of the press from the NSCI, and I'd describe this as just one small aspect of the NSCI and not the main thing, and certainly not some uh, sort of, we've got to be number one, it's, uh, you know, we've got to regain our lead. I don't think that's really the attitude within the government at all about this initiative. So in particular, I'd just simply say, you can't measure how fast a machine is by one, running one application on it and claiming that's it. Also, you can't measure how a nation's capability is in uh, computing or anything by looking at what's its, uh, you know, the performance of its best resource. What if we measured the effectiveness of transportation systems by which country has the fastest car, <laughs> the one fastest car? It, it makes no sense. Really, the issue in, in sort of the health of a, uh, of a computing community is what types of machines do they have? Is there diversity? Is there a healthy ecosystem of vendors, of users, of uh, programmers, of software, and so forth, an enterprise that's actually out there being used to solve important problems and making advances and keeping a research base that will sustain uh, onward progress. And I, I like what uh, the predecessor speaker said, when how are you going to measure performance? It's not going to be based on who's top in top 500. That makes no sense at all. But that's nonetheless an objective is to ensure that the U.S. is, uh, is in the lead, and I describe this as healthy competition. It's competition that makes us work harder and strive better. So in particular, uh, from an exascale point of view, the Department of Energy has been planning for exascale for a while and has some excellent planning documents uh, that it describes there. And part of the NSCI is to support the DOE's um, goals in that, toward that. And as you know, they've scoped out the, the uh, sort of general parameters of a machine they'd like, uh, perhaps the most ambitious one to keep the power under 20 megawatts. But otherwise, it's viewed as sort of pushing at the limits of technology, but in a way that can be successful. And also, if you look at the DOE document, again, they emphasize this isn't about one machine. This is about an entire ecosystem of capabilities of a variety of machines, of applications, of software, of trained people. So even within the exascale framework is a much more ambitious goal than just uh, being top in top 500. Uh, third is, um, so what about applications? And I think that everyone understands that the current uh, systems for writing programs for HPC is really not uh, good and it's going in the wrong direction. So if you look at a system like Titan or a modern supercomputer, you basically have to write programs at three different levels of abstraction. Down at the lowest level, there's some types of accelerator GPUs, say, that require their own programming. The nodes are typically a multi-core processor sharing memory, so there's something like OpenMP to do multi-threaded programming. And then the nodes communicate with themselves by message passing, so there's something like MPI to do that. And now if we uh, design an application to really take use of those resources, we have to carefully place what part of these different levels, different aspects of the computation will happen. Then we go off and buy a new machine, and all of a sudden we end up having to rewrite large amounts of code. So that's really not good. And you can point to many places where either it takes too much work to write the applications, or even worse, many applications just don't ever get onto HPC because it would be too much work to do it. Uh, and I like this quote that Dan Reed said, if, that uh, as the performance of these machines approach infinity, the number of people who can actually program them is approaching zero. Um, so really what we'd like, you know, in the dream of dreams is you'd like to be able to describe at a very high level the, um, uh, what you want to uh, compute based on abstractions similar to what you have when writing single-threaded applications. There's some model of what computation is, how data gets allocated and organized, um, how you deal with failures and faults. We'd like some reasonable uh, abstractions that sort of expose you to some of the realities of those issues without making you think about them and solve them directly within your application program. Uh, we'd like to sort of have a rich programming environment of libraries, compilers, auto-tuners, and all the tools required 
to uh, sort of make it possible to take these high-level descriptions and map them effectively onto different classes of machines. And, um, and uh, you know, a, a wider collection of sharing and better code reuse so that there's not so much redundant effort going on in, in program development. Um, and that goes along with the, the goal of, of accessibility, or uh, making sure that uh, all the different entities within this country, whether they're scientists working in big research labs or smaller ones, uh, similar companies at multinational companies or in small companies, have access to these resources. And uh, if you think about what are the barriers to entry, well, what, right now the software issue is a big barrier to entry. Uh, so if we fix that or make progress on that, that will be helpful. Uh, but also, I, I'd claim that a typical engineer coming out, uh, say a mechanical engineer graduating from school, has relatively little appreciation for what modeling, simulation, and data analysis can do, and especially how that can be mapped and make use of HPC class resources. So it's not just a problem at the computer or computation, but also getting people who are the ultimate uh, users and people with the applications to know and appreciate what the technologies can provide. Uh, from an accessibility point of view, right now we have relatively little deployment. The big companies can afford to uh, buy and maintain and do all the work to keep these going. Uh, but the small to medium companies really don't have much uh, opportunity. And a uh, similar goes on with universities. So there's critical resources provided by the DOE, by the National Science Foundation, and those are very uh, helpful, but their total impact on society is relatively limited. Um, so uh, what's the future? Well, if we could think of other deployment models, and one of them that's arisen in the data world is cloud computing and been extremely successful for making it possible uh, for a large class of, of enterprises to make use of, of large-scale computing, but not really HPC-level computing. Is there a sort of similar mechanisms that would create a sustainable uh, enterprise that would let, uh, uh, provide the kind of access we want? And as I say, I don't think we collectively really know what that model is going to look like. That's something that needs to be developed. Uh, and then finally, I think everyone here appreciates the, the challenge being faced in the hardware world of keeping up the, the progress that we've seen over the years. And we've had this amazing period of time for the past about uh, 40, well, if you think from 1971 to 2004 was this period of remarkable where Moore's Law just kept ticking along and uh, Denard's scaling was still holding and everything was great. And, uh, we uh, basically a generation or so of people never had to worry about uh, where the hardware uh, would come from. But since then, and especially looking into the future, it's getting more and more difficult. So uh, we, we believe that industry will largely maintain and keep the, the CMOS engine going and uh, push it to its limits, and they, they're very destined to do that. But, uh, there's many other technologies uh, in the distant horizon that might be the uh, successors to CMOS, say carbon nanotubes or quantum computing or cryogenic computing. But none of these are anywhere close to being ready for commercial deployment. So this is a classic example of where federal research should come in, that the government funds basic research in areas that are uh, pre-competitive and too far ahead in the, the future for industry to really be uh, investing in. So the role for government in this is, is absolutely clear. But of course, these new technologies aren't going to just be plug replacements for what we have today. We can anticipate that they'll uh, bring about new models of computation, potentially, new architectures, new needs for how they're programmed and um, how they're operated and so forth. And so once these new hardware technologies become more clear, there's going to have to be uh, all the other layers of development built on top of it. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Tim, and he'll talk more about the uh, implementation side of the NSCI. Thank you, Randy. So, so now I think you've gotten a really great overview of 
why we're doing the NSCI and what our objectives are. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about actually what we're doing, what we've done so far, and how we want to work in, in the future. And as Randy said, we, we greatly admire uh, the, the preceding uh, um, talk where we were able to, to lay out the uh, things very much more clearly. I think you'll find that we're, we're moving, we, we're exploring, and we're, we're going to be doing this together um, as we go forward. So let's see. So, so I guess the first question is, well, what does success look like? And no, it's not just having one machine that's on the top of the top 500. There, there's, there's some real questions here about how, how will we measure ourselves. I, I'll tell you, I'm a, a cybersecurity guy you know, in the, my other half of my uh, day job, and we're always trying to find metrics to say, when is this successful? And so we, we've been thinking about this. What would the first, what this, this success look like? Quickly, it's, it's again that convergence of intensive and uh, of uh, simulation and data intensive computing. If systems are available that really can satisfy that need, then we will have succeeded. Um, yes, we want to keep the US in the lead. Europe wants to be in the lead. We all want to be in the lead. But that is a goal for us. We're spending taxpayer dollars to help make it happen. Um, we want to streamline that HPC application development. We, uh, that was a great quote from Dan Reed, but you, you know, it's, it, we need to be, if we want new areas of science to take advantage of high performance computing, new areas of manufacturing, new areas of business, we have to have many, many more people who can program these machines. And so we have to find a way to make that just much easier and much more accessible. Um, the machines, people have to be able to get to them uh, one way or another. Not everyone is going to be able to own these systems themselves, run it and operate it themselves. And we need to do a better job of making these systems available. And then the last is that as, um, as the, the natural limits for scaling for, for uh, charge-based CMOS, uh, oh, as we run into them, if we've got new options, then we will have succeeded. So I'm going to run a little bit through sort of how the NSCI got to here, what we've been doing since we announced it, um, what's next. Uh, I will say July 29 was when the executive order was issued. That was not the beginning. There was about two and a half years of very hard work with a really great team of people. We had Rob Leland from Sandia. We had Jerry Blasey from Northern Illinois University. We had Michael Johnson and Aaron Zulman from uh, Department of Energy. This was a real team effort. A lot of people put a lot of time into getting to this space. Um, along with that, we had an awful lot of government agencies working together over the last two years to help shape this and make sure that this was something that wasn't just the White House saying, oh, you guys should go and do this. This was something that the agencies agreed met the right priorities, were something that they wanted to participate in. That's really, really key, um, especially because this is something that we want to go on for quite a while. Um, the day after the executive order was issued, we actually held our first outreach event. We had a private roundtable with academia and the private sector. We had 30, uh, 30 uh, uh, private sector luminaries come in to meet with, uh, with uh, Dr. Holdren, the, uh, the president's science director. Uh, um, and that was a really great session. Uh, we have had our first official executive council meeting, which is the group of the interagency group that is going to sort of watch over all of this. Um, we have had an RFI that went out about science and, and capable exascale. And we've had a workshop with over 200 people. Um, we've delivered an implementation plan. And now we're off to what's in the future. So give you a few more details about this. One of the key things that the executive order laid out was it laid out the swim lanes for the agencies. Somebody has to be sort of in charge. Well, in this case, actually three agencies need to be in charge. Department of Defense, Department of Energy, National Science Foundation. But we also had agencies that we wanted to empower to lead the way on R&D, NIST and IARPA. And then there were the agencies, agencies that I think have traditionally been called fast followers, 
We don't want them to be following so much. We want them to be right with us. We call them deployment agencies. NASA, NOAA, FBI, DHS, NIH, several of them have really great booths. I was really impressed to see down on the expo floor. So the first executive council meeting, we brought together all of those agencies. And it was, it was really actually very, very encouraging because even though we had it in August, uh, the president goes on uh, his vacation in August. And many of the, uh, the leads at the agencies take advantage of that to get a little vacation time in themselves. Even though it was in August, we had several uh, uh, agency heads and we had a lot of deputies. People really wanted to be participating and they sent their best available people. And so that was really a great, a great data point. Um, we created a subcommittee for the national security missions. The executive order is really about um, economic competitiveness and scientific discovery. But we've been doing national security things too for HPC. And if we're going to do what we're calling a whole of government approach, you can't do it without the national security people. So we created a subcommittee and we brought them into the game as well. There's a group called the Networking and Information Technology R&D Program, or NIDRD. And uh, they actually are a group that does a lot of coordination and collaboration in a lot of areas, including high performance computing. And they were tasked to take the lead on, um, uh, on putting together an implementation plan. And they established a, a, a task force to do the workshop. So the initial implementation plan, this is something that was called for in the executive order. Um, we gave the agencies in the executive order 90 days to put together an implementation plan. Um, then when we lost a month before we had the first executive council meeting, that, that brought them down to 60. Um, the agencies worked very, very hard to put together a, a plan, a plan that covers all those bullet items that, that I listed there. Um, and a lot of agency-specific highlights. Agencies put a lot of effort into putting this together. So we went beyond that first three-level bullets of um, what are the swim lanes, who are the lead agencies, who are the foundational agencies, who are the deployment agencies, and started to talk about how are we really going to work together. Now, the first version, given that it was only 60 days, um, and there was a lot of inside baseball in it, and we're still in the midst of some of the budget pieces, this particular of the implementation version of the implementation plan is not something that we're sharing yet. I've had a number of people come up to me on the floor and say, but how are we going to work together if you don't tell us what you're doing? We, absolutely correct. We, we understand. We're going to be working on a public summary for early in 2016 that, that provides more light on all of this subject for, for all of our partners that we hope to have in this, uh, this grand ride. In the, in the, so a lot of that was just there. I was talking about how are we working together within government um, who are on the, in the areas where we're uh, concentrated on high performance computing. But it's more than just having all the supercomputing people talk to each other. Because there's a lot of other initiatives going on in government that either will contribute to the success of the NSCI or will benefit from the success of the NSCI. Things like the Materials Genome Initiative. They can use better supercomputers to understand the, the, the properties of materials. We need those better materials to be able to make advances in manufacturing, to actually be able to build a, a, a supercomputers, a, a capable exascale machine that meets those at 20 megawatt uh, power envelope. Uh, advanced manufacturing initiatives. We certainly hope that we're going to be able to benefit both from improvements in manufacturing and that we're going to help make manufacturing better. Nanotechnology initiative, again, the same thing. The brain initiative. So there's a big initiative to understand how the brain works. Well, we're also interested in things like neuromorphic computing. How do you build computers that, that think like the brain thinks if you don't actually know how the brain works. On the other hand, if you're trying to understand how the brain works, wouldn't it be better to have better machines to do your simulation and modeling? Again, precision medicine, the big data initiative, photonics, all of these places that are places for synergy within government. So we've been working very hard both over the past few years and since the executive order was signed to get our internal house in order. So we've, 
We've been building a whole of government effort. We know, though, that we don't have a monopoly on good ideas. And in fact, we need all the good ideas if we're going to succeed. So we're proud of what we've achieved over the last three years in terms of putting together um, a robust team, a well-coordinated effort within government. But we need to make this a whole of nation effort. That has been our goal from the very beginning. It's also been the way we have traditionally succeeded in high performance computing. We've done our best work when it's been business and government working collaboratively. So we're looking to establish a similar level of coordination and collaboration with academia, with private industry, and yes, with international partners. Um, so far, we've had that, that in, an industry roundtable, as I said. We've had a workshop and the request for information. Um, and we've asked for more help in shaping and promoting follow-on activities. A couple of quick themes from the industry roundtable. I think that they repeat from many themes that you have heard um, at other times in other talks this week, uh, in earlier today as well. Programming is a really significant cost, particularly in terms of human capital. If I'm spending all of my time taking my old code and making it work on the new machines, there's an opportunity cost. I wasn't able to actually put those really high quality programmers and move them into doing something new. And we want to make that simpler so that we can, get, uh, uh, we can reduce the cost of programming for these applications. DOE's co-design process is something that, that has been going on for a long time. This is something that needed to be embraced and extended was the recommendation that we were hearing from private, the private sector. Another one is, look, the threat model is changing. Let's, be, let's really make a resolution that we're going to build cybersecurity in the right way from the beginning on this round of systems. As a cybersecurity guy, of course, I wanted to put this bullet on the top here, but I don't think that was fair. So I, I put it where I think it really ranked, ranked in, the, in, the, in the meeting. Um, another one was that, and we've heard this again and again, the business models for cloud computing offer challenges and opportunities for us in the high performance computing world. And last but absolutely not least, the whole ecosystem matters. The workshop. The workshop, now this is what it was, was um, we, I should say, uh, um, people got a very short amount of notice and they were very enthusiastic and a lot of people made changes in their, in their, uh, in, in their schedules to be able to be part of this. And we were really so grateful because this we saw as the real kickoff for the NSCI. We had about 250 participants mostly um, industry and academia, a lot of government people though as well. And there were a lot of themes that came out of that. I think that those themes, again, they resonate with other things that you've heard here. Um, uh, there were things about you know, different paths for, the, the paths for past charge-based CMOS are, um, it's more uncertain than it has been at any time for a number of years. Um, we keep talking about wanting a convergence of systems. A lot of people at the meeting said, at the workshop said, Convergence is great, that's where we want to get, but we can do some of these things now with closely coupled systems. We can do, do different ways. Don't assume that the only way to get that convergence is to build the one big perfect machine. Noted, and we agree with that. Um, there, were, there, were, there were a lot of things about cloud computing again as being a place that we better learn our lessons from. That They've got business models that work we want to co-opt them and, 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 and absorb them our, ourselves. And then we have to engage with the, with the uh, non-computing sectors if we want to really get broad deployment. The exascale request for information, I know this is an eye chart, but basically we had a request for information that went out from NSF, NIH, and DOE and um, they were really looking for what are the specific scientific and research challenges that would benefit from a 100-fold increase in performance. Something that was in the EO that I'm not sure if we highlighted earlier, I'm probably repeating it, but I want to say it again anyway. Um, when, when we said capable, when we, in the EO, we talk about get, achieving capable exascale. And we didn't define that as being an exaflop in performance. We define that as being 100 times the, 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 the application performance 
on applications of, of national interest. We want to get the 100-fold increase in performance, and if that takes less or more than an exaflops, that's okay with us. That's the point. It's all about the applications, as you said earlier in, your, in yours. Um, we have, a, I, I want to say, it just closed on Friday, the request for, uh, for information, right, looking for these impacts and limitations and barriers. Um, we don't actually have a deep analysis yet of the responses to the, to, to, the, uh, to the RFI, but we did get well over 200 responses, which we were extremely pleased by. Um, a very large number from the DOE National Laboratories and an almost as large number from academia. Very, very happy with that. I would have loved to have seen a larger number of industry responses and foreign responses, but considering the actual uh, um, target, of the uh, RFI, I think that that's, that, that is to be um, expected. I was actually asked to say by the, uh, I should go back one, the, um, the folks who are running the RFI said, said to ask me to please say, while the RFI is closed, late submissions are always accepted and would be of interest. So if people did not know this RFI was out there and you feel that you missed it, please don't please let us know what you have to, uh, to say, because we are really interested. If it's going to be uh, a national, a, a, a whole of nation effort, that means we have to be looking at the whole of nation problems. So that's been kind of a race through what we've been doing over the past three years to actually bring a national strategic computing initiative into its infancy. Uh, what are we going to be doing now? We're gonna be continuing to meet in government. We're gonna be doing a lot more outreach. This is really, really important to us. We're gonna be doing a public facing uh, a version of the implementation plan because we know we can't ask you to coordinate with us if we don't tell you what we're doing. A lot more in-depth engagements. We are looking to work with you. In short, we are looking for partners and I hope that you will, uh, that some of the, the goals that we have will resonate with you and that we can look for ways to work together in the future. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm uh, going to, again, re resume uh, taking questions off of the, uh, where you can submit them on the uh, SC application. Um, so the first one I'm going to go is, uh, given budget pressures and uncertainty, how bipartisan is the support for NSCI? Is government funding going to drive the initiative? I'll take that one. So actually, um, um, I, I'm actually pretty lucky. I'm working on cybersecurity and high-performance computing, which happen to be uh, two of the um, a small number of bipartisan things that are out there. We have actually had really good support in the past. I think that if you look at, there have been a number of, uh, of public letters that have been sent by uh, members of the Senate. I think if you look at those kinds of things, you will see that they really break down um, very, they do not break down along party lines at all. That I think that we believe that, uh, that this is the kind of thing that if we make the case that this can be a bipartisan effort and that we can get support across the board. So we, we believe that, that, that we have that potential here. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, all right, so the, another question with a large number of votes, you, you kind of already answered, Randy, but I'm, I'm gonna bring it up again to give you a chance to elaborate a little bit more. It's very short in the way it was termed. China is ahead by 2x. Is that a problem? Um, well, I think some people rally around that particular one. But as I said, I think it's ridiculous to measure a country by uh, who has the fastest machine and even how, to, how you measure those machines. So I think we really need to, you know, in some ways it would be a relatively easy thing for us to run out and build a 35 uh, petaflop machine and claim that now we're number one. Uh, but that's really, we're trying to do something much more ambitious. We're trying to really change the entire national landscape and make high performance computing uh, used in a very widespread way. So that's a lot more work and that's really what the intention of the initiative is. Very good. Let's see. 
right. Um, can a single system really handle data analytics and large scale compute well? I think, you know, I think what Tim just said was the right attitude is we're not sort of trying to pick winners and losers here. We're just saying that if there were a type of system that could handle lots of data and lots of computation in a fairly tightly connected way, then whole new applications would arise. Whether that's physically one monolithic machine or a, a collection of machines that are fairly uh, closely linked to each other, that really remains to be seen. And I don't think it's, uh, I think it's premature to pick one versus another. At this so, and I'd like to add one thing to that. I, th I think that there are, I, I mean, you, Certainly, we could build a machine if we can optimize for simulation or optimize for data intensive computing. We can build a better machine for that application. But there are applications that we think are very compelling, and there are going to be more of those, we believe, that really do require some of that convergence. And so um, some of this is you, you say, can one machine really do both well? Well, there are problems that if they don't do both well, that, that it will not solve that application well. And that's where it's all about the applications. All right. Um, how do you plan to prioritize investments in high risk, high reward technologies like quantum and neuromorphic? So, so you know, we, we've, we've um, highlighted uh, two foundational R&D agencies, uh, NIST and IARPA. I think we, we're going to be looking to the agencies that actually are going to be directly funding the research to uh, make good choices. But we're also going to be coordinating those activities to make sure that we have broad coverage. Um, it would be a shame if no one was funding any quantum computing or any neuromorphic computing research. So we are going to be um, you know, looking to, to spread uh, uh, the wealth until things become more certain. I think what, what we really do is we look to places like IARPA, places like NSF, places like NIST, to actually have the skilled um, program managers, the skilled researchers to actually help us narrow in and make those better choices. Um, but, but we're not gonna do it in OSTP. We're not gonna make those decisions ourselves because we don't think that the future is certain enough to make those bets. So I'm gonna ask a follow-up question on that. Do you see them having a role in the, I'll call them the exascale systems, or is it, beyond that that you really see? Oh, I think we're talking beyond exascale. I think the general belief is we can kind of turn the CMOS crank, uh, well, literally two more times. The coral systems will be one more turn of the crank, and then the exascale system will be another turn of the crank. And then, you know, beyond that, who knows? But I think the, the investment in the technology is more looking to ensure that 15 to 20 years from now, we'll be able to sort of continue the the progress of HPC in the kind of directions we want. I, I would also add to that, I think that's ab absolutely correct, but the, the, the other piece is that we, we do hope, you know, classical computing is not, uh, a digital computing is not going to end with exascale. We're still going to be, be um, uh, needing to do, you know, neuromorphic and quantum won't solve all of the problems that we have. And so uh, we certainly hope that some of those technologies will translate back and that there will be some benefits. It will not be neuromorphic computing or quantum computing that we're doing, but perhaps some of the advances that we make in that 15 years will translate back into some of the digital computing pieces as well. So, but, but absolutely true in the next 10 years that we don't expect them to be the, the, the thing that drives it. Okay. Um, so here's a question that was similar uh, for one that was asked of Panos. Um, any limitations on foreign responses? Who can, can't reply? So, so um, we have been, you know, we have been very much focused on getting our own internal house in order. Most of the last three years has been getting government to talk to each other and collaborate. The next step, obviously, is working with our academia, our, uh, our own business sector. But of course, on the other hand, what is a US business anymore? Almost all businesses are global. We do understand that what benefits that we have will benefit others. And we hope to get 
you know, we hope to learn from Price and other initiatives as well. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're expecting to collaborate internationally. Um, it sort of is a walk before we run is where, where we are. Very good. Um, I'm going to ask two more questions. I'll have to pick out the second one. But um, with all of the various EXA star efforts, happening in parallel, how should the various organizations communicate? So it kind of goes back to, you said you focused on how to get our house in order. So how, how, how are we doing that? Well, historically, that's what the NIDR D program is really, was set up by the High Performance Act of 1992 to do, was to coordinate across federal agencies. And it's not easy, I should tell you, because every federal agency has a different uh, budgeting process, a different uh, set of uh, oversight committees in the House and the Senate, and so it's hard to do it, but I think one of the objectives of the NSCI is to try, to whatever extent possible, to try and uh, get those agencies, and we've seen fairly uh, great interest in the agencies when they get together and start talking and, and really coordinating. So I'd say NIDR D, though, will be uh, the structure within which, and then this Executive Council will be the structures which are are keeping these things together. Do you anticipate some of the funding specifically being applied to that coordination? Or, you know, I mean, a, so, a lot of it's going kind of in. So, so, um, so, so NIDR D is already funded. It's funded by the agencies. There's, there's already a structure uh, for that. Um, and things like the Executive Council, we just sort of take that out of hide, as we say. Uh, it, there, there won't be a specific funding stream for that. I think the much more, from our point of view, the much more important uh, questions of funding streams have to do with the fundings at the specific agencies so that they can fulfill their obligations under the NSCI, so that they can com complete the things that are in their role and responsibilities. So uh, we're much more concerned about that level of funding than the funding, the coordination, efforts, we kind of sort that out, uh, at least within the U.S. government, uh, as, um, as we roll along. Everybody pays their own freight to participate in that. In that. Uh, yeah, I'm somewhat familiar with that. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, so for the final question, how will we ensure that the hardware software integrators leverage the strengths of each uh, exascale initiative? So I, I think uh, of if One's working here and one's working there. How, how will we bring, make sure that the technology partners are, are working as, as a whole? Supercomputing 16 and 17? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, 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 I um, so, so we, we, you know, we have the co-design efforts. We have things that we do to try to make sure that the application developers and the, the hardware developers are actually speaking with each other and that they, that, that, that they're not off writing code from machines that aren't at all what people are building. Um, but, but I mean, it's a hard, that's a very hard effort. It, it, it's true. And with there being different efforts on different continents, uh, yes, absolutely. Trying to make sure that we um, are aware so that we can use the best of breed for each of, uh, each of the, these solutions. I mean, we say, you know, we in government know we're not going to have all of the best solutions. We in North America probably aren't going to have all the best solutions just here as well. And so we do have to be spending that time that's really something that um, you know, only happens through the kinds of relationships between the researchers and between the, the, the companies. It, it, it isn't something that we can completely do from the top down. So you know, I think it's a, a lot of it is incumbent upon the people who are here. So, so I said supercomputing 16 and 17 is a joke, but not really. Um, this is where a lot of that's going to happen, I think. Great. All right, well, let's thank our speakers again. Thank you all.